Thanks to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video. Does life originate from stardust? Interestingly, this is something the aptly named Stardust spacecraft did not originally set out to discover, but it's a question that its findings have provoked. And it's all thanks to including the lightest substance in the world on board. The Stardust spacecraft is known for its involvement with the Deep Impact NASA mission to the comet Temple 1. However, this was not Stardust's first mission, nor its primary one. Before Temple 1, Stardust was out collecting data on another comet by doing something that no other probe before it had done. Its mission was to travel to the comet Vild 2, collect some of the material from its coma, and then deliver the sample intact back to Earth. And given that this would involve catching particles that were moving at over 23,000 km per hour, all without damaging them, this was no easy task. I'm Alex McColgan, and you're watching Astrum. Join with me today as we explore how Stardust managed to accomplish this incredible feat and uncover what Stardust's findings taught us about cometary origins as well as our own. In the late 1990s, cometary science was still in the early stages. Although we had sent six probes up to visit these enigmatic celestial bodies, not very much was known about their origins. It was believed at the time that comets were foreign visitors to our solar system, older than the Sun, having been formed from the loose pre-solar grains of dust that orbit other stars, before drifting through space towards us, only to be caught up in the Sun's gravitational pull. It was believed that this theory could be confirmed by travelling to one of these comets and picking up some of this loose dust, or star dust, that surrounds them in space. By examining the isotopic composition, scientists would be able to tell if it was unusual when compared to the dust given off by our own star. However, this was a challenging mission. As is often the case, it came down to a question of speed and energy. Comets travel through the inner solar system at speeds reaching 160,000 km per hour. While it was possible for a probe to try and match that speed and come up alongside it, this had to be done without needing too much fuel, or the weight of the craft would be too heavy and thus too expensive to get into space in the first place. For this mission, scientists selected a comet known as Vild 2. They believed that they would be able to get Stardust alongside Vild 2 at a relatively low velocity. However, this velocity would still be around 6.5 km per second, or 23,400 km per hour. As you can imagine, catching even particles at that speed would be extremely challenging. Although particles would likely not do too much damage to Stardust, being too small to really impact it, it would do irreparable damage to the particles themselves. When an object crashes at 23,400 km per hour into a surface, the odds of it keeping its original shape and structure are incredibly small. Scientists would not learn much about the structure of these particles if they smash those particles into pieces, not to mention the warping effect all that kinetic energy being suddenly converted into thermal would have on the molecular bonds involved. So, what was their solution? What was their mechanism for catching objects traveling at those speeds? Well, much like how an airbag softens the blow for you if you are involved in a car crash, scientists realized that they would need an airbag of their own. Something that would not halt the particle all at once, but would reduce its speed over a longer distance, thus reducing the amount of crushing deceleration involved. For this, they found an incredible material that was basically air. Solid air they decided to use aerogel. Aerogel is a fascinating substance that was discovered in 1931 by Samuel Kistler when he made a bet with fellow scientist Charles Learned about jelly. As you've probably seen if you've ever made it yourself, jelly is formed of two parts. Firstly, a relatively solid structure that acts like a kind of sponge, and secondly, water. When you add water to solid cubes of dense jelly, it absorbs the water and expands into the wobbly substance we are familiar with. If you were to extract the water, the solid part of the jelly would normally contract again. Kistler's bet with Learned was to be the first one to remove all of the liquid from the jelly without making it shrink. In short, to make a jelly that was entirely filled with air, an air jelly. 
Without going into all the details, Kistler won his bet and at the same time invented the first aerogel. Aerogel is a fascinating substance as it is usually over 99% air and yet has the structural strength to support bricks. Nowadays it tends to be made from silica composites rather than jelly, but can be made from a wide range of materials. It is incredibly light and is, strangely enough, an even better insulator than regular air. And most importantly for stardust, when particles hit it, it would offer just the right amount of resistance to slow down the particle without denaturing or destroying it. The trails left behind in the aerogel would also be useful for scientists to spot where a particle had been captured. Stardust was fitted with a tennis racket sized aerogel collector tray made up of 90 blocks of aerogel 3 cm thick with over 1000 square centimeters of surface area which would be deployed from inside the main body whenever sampling was to take place. Stardust would also capture from the interstellar medium to allow comparisons and to learn more about the dust in our own solar system. Once it had collected these samples, it would store them on a sample return capsule which would be fired back towards the Earth for re-entry and collection. This SRC was 80 cm by 50 cm, weighed 45 kg and came fitted with an aero shield, navigation recovery aids and a parachute. Also on board Stardust was a navigation camera, a cometry and interstellar dust analyzer and a dust flux monitoring system, among other scientific devices. The probe launched on the 7th of February 1999 and spent the next five years traveling through space, passing the asteroid 5535 Anne Frank along the way, which it took some photos of. But on the 2nd of January 2004, it finally arrived at its target, Comet Ville 2 and what it found was immediately extraordinary. Scientists had not expected much from Phil 2. Some NASA scientists described their expectation of it to be a rather bland object looking somewhat like a black potato. However, this is not what they found. Instead, the surface of Phil 2 was covered with spiky pinnacles hundreds of meters tall, cliffs, massive holes jetting dust and gas out into space, even on parts of the comet that were pointed away from the sun and thus were expected to be less reactive. In short, the surface of the comet was unexpectedly alive and self-renewing. Something else was just as notable for its absence, craters. Unlike almost every other body in our solar system with surfaces exposed to space, there were no craters on the surface of Vild 2. This puts it in stark contrast to places like Mars or our own moon. Given the period of time Vil 2 is thought to have existed, it surely must have encountered other objects which impacted with it. So where had these craters gone? It shows that the comet's surface can either be self-renewing or active, reducing signs of visible craters over short time frames, astronomically speaking. And of course, during this flyby, Stardust had its aerogel collector exposed and it was rapidly collecting dust samples. Just listen to the frequency in which dust struck the spacecraft. The samples were carefully stowed away, and upon reaching the vicinity of Earth, Stardust ejected the SRC. The angle of approach had to be just right as it was traveling at tremendous speed. If the approach angle was too low, it would just skim off the atmosphere and fly back into space. If the angle was too high, the heat would disintegrate the capsule. So it was with great relief that the DC-8 NASA airplane monitoring the sky saw it approaching at just the right second and just the right angle. The SRC landed in the Utah desert where it was recovered, everything having worked and deployed just as it was designed to. And taking the samples back to the lab, scientists learned another completely unexpected fact about Comet Ville 2. It was not a visitor to our solar system at all. Unlike what had previously been believed, Comet Vil 2 had not originated from another star, it had been born from our own. By comparing the isotopic composition of the particles Stardust collected with the samples from our own solar system, it was proven that Comet Vil 2 originated from the solar system. And contrary to what all the ice on its surface might lead you to believe, the rock at its center was formed under white hot conditions. 
Chondrules and calcium aluminium inclusions were both found among the samples Stardust collected. These are structures that only form under incredibly hot conditions and can be found in other asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. So scientists had to rethink their theory that comets formed in cold conditions at the edge of solar systems, even if they do spend some time there. Both fire and ice go into making comets. And thanks to the careful, delicate way that the particles had been collected, scientists were able to find out one last surprising thing, the amino acid glycine. Amino acids are the building blocks that make up proteins, that are vital for all living things. Although this does not mean that there was anything alive on Comet Ville 2, this does lend weight to the idea that it was from comets such as this, crashing into our Earth millions of years ago, that life's first building blocks found their way to our planet, which I'm sure you will agree offers a tantalizing glimpse into our own origins. What happened next for Stardust? As only the SRC was sent back to Earth, Stardust remained in space and had enough fuel to visit another object, Comet Temple 1, which is just as well as the deep impact mission there didn't go as planned, and you can find out more about Stardust's involvement with that mission here. After this extended mission, with all its fuel used up, it sent one last transmission to Earth to acknowledge that it was being turned off for good. Comets are truly fascinating things, and it was thanks to the incredible work of the Stardust probe and all those who worked on it that we could make these discoveries. Who would have expected that as we looked out across the wide universe, we would discover things that would help us understand ourselves better? But thanks to them, we now know, life's origins might just lie in stardust. Which is exactly what this excellent documentary on Magellan TV is all about, called Birth of Planet Earth, where early in the solar system's tumultuous beginnings, Earth was bombarded with comets just like Vild 2. It also talks about the influence of Jupiter, how the moon formed, and just everything Earth had to go through to get to the stage it is today. Magellan TV has a whole host of documentaries on a range of topics like science and the natural world, so if you are looking for more space videos, Magellan TV might be a good option for you. Right now, you can get an additional annual subscription for free with every annual subscription you purchase, a great potential Christmas gift for someone you know who also likes documentaries. If you want to watch Birth of Planet Earth and get access to this buy one get one free deal, check the link in the description below. Thanks for watching, and thanks to my patrons and members for supporting the channel. Please consider supporting too if you find value in these videos. Even a like and a share really go a long way to helping me make more videos like these in the future. All the best, and see you next time.